Welcome to News Talk with Simone Ivani at the International News Channel. I'm sure by now all of you have heard about the disappearance and murder of 22-year-old Instagram adventurer Gabby Petito in Wyoming, United States. Her initial disappearance made headlines almost instantly and gained overwhelming media coverage as the case progressed. While Americans and Canadians are sympathizing with the news, everyone is also pointing fingers at media outlets for their unfair media coverage. News is that there are currently 710 missing indigenous people from the same state Petito's remains were ultimately found, but those cases received almost no media attention. MSNBC's Joy Reid has called it the missing white woman syndrome. Reid questioned, why not the same media attention when people of color go missing? Zach Summers, a sociologist at Northwestern University, undertook research on the matter on his own in 2013. He found that missing white women were more likely to be the subject of news coverage and that also with a different intensity compared to missing white men or missing men and women of color. Joining me today to discuss this further are my fellow co-hosts Julia Cosby and Ava Blackwell. Welcome back ladies. Hey. Hi, thanks for having us. <laughs> I guess first of all I want to talk to you guys about the Gabby Petito case. Had you heard about her before? Were you familiar with her work? What was the situation there on your personal end? Nope. I've never heard of her until I heard of this story, and um, she has 1.1 uh, million followers, so that was pretty impressive, but I had never heard of her. Yeah, before the media blew up the case, I had never heard of her either. Okay, well, after the media blew up her case, what was your initial reaction on her disappearance and then eventually the discovery of her body? Well, I think when anyone passes and when you discover anybody, that's obviously very traumatic for the family. That's something I don't like to hear about. It's it's definitely very sad. Um, I just feel really bad for her family. I feel the same, Julia, and I feel that, um, you know, although there is some closure when you do find uh, a missing person's mm. body, it does it lets the family know what happens happened it, to a certain extent. Obviously, no. there's a lot of bereavement, and it opens up a whole other set of questions. Yeah, no, it does. And honestly, our true. condolences to her family and anyone who knew her personally, for that matter. So her fiancé is still missing. Do you guys think there was foul play involved, or do you think there's more brewing in the pot? That's not really, like, my place to say, because I'm not a, a state detective, state police. I feel like they have all the information that mm -hmm. they need, and they're constantly finding new information. It's really not for me to say anything or get involved in their cases. And it's not even in the country I live in, so. <laughs> That's true. Obviously, I feel the same. I, I'll leave that up to the professionals to handle, and we'll watch and report as the case unfolds. Fair enough. And now, changing gears a bit. Are you both familiar with the term missing white woman syndrome? Yes, I believe the late uh, Gwen Ifill coined the term uh, during a journalist of color conference in 2004. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, no, that's correct. Yeah, I, I just, um, one thing I would like to point out and uh, make really clear that I know with this story it deals with a lot of like indigenous issues and you can still be indigenous and be white and I feel like in being indigenous or being native, um, that's more of a cultural thing and uh, when you kind of separate them, I don't know how I feel about that, mm -hmm. um, because you, you can be both. No, fair enough. And as journalists, or based on your personal experience or what you've seen in the media, do you guys agree that the media can be biased occasionally, whether it's intentional or unintentional? Yes. And <laughs> obviously it's a pertinent issue. Yeah, yeah. I, I think because there's just so much information sometimes when you're when you're writing a story or putting together a story, mm -hmm. um, it, it's really hard and you really have to know who your audience is. Yeah. Um, some journalists, if they had all the means and all the time and they could write as long as they would, they would probably write some novels if they could. But uh, the job of journalists who are writing for certain outlets is they have to summarize everything and condense everything. Mm -hmm. And as much as they would like to link, well, this point is actually linked to this because of this, because of this, you really have to cut out a lot of information, which could make something seem a little bit biased, which is always, it, it's always a debate. It's always really hard to decide what you cut out and what you keep. Yeah. I mentioned Summers a while ago, so in his research, he pulled out a couple of reasons for the bias. He claimed most coverage decisions come from the newsroom, and American newsroom's racial makeup remains disproportionately white. He also put up the idea of making coverage decisions based on economic decisions, and missing white women are likely worth more in terms of eyeballs and revenue. How much truth do you think that holds? 
Well, uh, to further your point and to quote Mar Martin G. Reynolds, who's an executive director of the Maynard Institute for Journalism and Education, uh, he states that our newsrooms don't reflect the diversity of the country and folks in editing roles are even less diverse. Until journalism corrects this, we are going to continue to be more and more irrelevant to audiences that reflect that feature. Um, I think that it's an unfortunate uh, perceived truth Mm. Uh, that deals with a lot of things. There's classism, ageism, racism that is perpetuating the false statement in traditional media mm. that white women are more valuable. They're not. White women are more valuable to audience members and to society. Mm. And I think that truth needs to be shattered. We're all human beings. We all contribute to society. We need to, um, s we need to put pressure on the media uh, to start showcasing that truth. No, fair enough. I think he hit that right on the head. Julia? I think that this is an American story, and a lot of the places that we're taking reference from are uh, people who live in the States. And although uh, Canada and the USA have a lot of very uh, big similarities, they are completely different countries. And so I've never actually worked in the United States of American markets, uh, like uh, CNN or Fox News or any of those stations over there. So I don't really know how they operate mm -hmm. and what their newsrooms really look like. And unless I had firsthand experience, I can't really comment on that. But speaking of the Petito case in particular, do you think that the case received a bit more than normal media coverage? And if so, was it because she was white or because she was a celebrity with the 1.1 million subscribers, as we just said? I honestly think it was both. Um, look, in one respect, uh, this really showcases the power of social media. There was a couple of different uh, accounts that I found in my research that really helped to get the case a little bit more traction because it wasn't getting as much um, media coverage as was necessary to find her. As we all know, there's a short window of time to find a person when they're missing, so it's important to get as much media coverage as possible in the first 36 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Often doesn't happen. But uh, there was an account um, from Paris Campbell on TikTok, she was also uh, a, like an avid TikToker, and she uh, and a new mother, and she sort of started championing the case. And then Kyle and Jen Bethune um, were informed from a friend that they might have been in the same area as uh, Petito, um, also traveling with their van. So they were able to review the footage that they took from for their YouTube mm -hmm. um, channel, and they saw her van, and they were able to alert authorities to that. And also Haley Tumain has also been uh, actively championing her case. So in that regard, uh, we see the positive side effects of it, whether it's because uh, Petito was already involved in that community and, they, and these influencers wanted to support their community further, or whether it's because she's white, I, d I don't really know. I think it's just uh, sad that she died and sad that the family has to deal with all of this. And I can say that, you know, I never heard about her before mm. uh, hearing about the story um, a few days ago, but I will say that I did hear a lot about Kim Kardashian in a bathtub and who was robbed. So it's yeah. weird that we hear it's about these celebrity stories more than uh, like local people who go missing and even in my own community. Um, uh, I, I think that's sad in a way, and um, it's it's weird that I know about this Kim K story, but not about uh, too many of my local stories. Yeah. But it's, the yeah. media works in mysterious ways, I guess. Speaking of mysterious ways, what kind of changes would you guys like to see implemented in newsrooms in terms of media coverage for missing people? Well, to be honest, I don't. I don't hear too much about missing people on my local media or if it's a really, really big case, national media, if it's a, like a countrywide manhunt, usually we'll hear about it. But if not, I don't, I don't really hear about it. Maybe if someone substantial internationally goes missing, like some kind of president or prime minister or royal, I feel like I would hear about that. But locally, I feel like the television stations, newspapers haven't been doing, I feel, in my view, the best job. But although on social media, that's where I hear all the information about missing people, and mm. that's where I feel like it gets shared the most, and the most information is delivered to me. So I feel like it's less in traditional media, and more in this new form of media where we're hearing about all of these cases come in, where the traditional media only has a certain 
I guess, time span to explain everything. But with social media, you, you can share anything. You can mm -hmm. share any amount of information as long as the person clicking the button wants to continue clicking. So I think that's uh, like a wonderful thing about this new technology is we can hear about all these cases, we can dig in deeper, and we're not just limited to what uh, some announcer wants to tell us or yeah. what a, a time frame uh, m makes you only see, you know? No, that's fair, and I'm not sure about you guys, but I actually heard about the Petito case in particular on social media. Yeah. I found the case on social media first, so that says a lot about media everywhere, or our local media, as Julia is saying as well. Same. And uh, to, just to answer your previous question mm -hmm. and to further Julia's point here, as we're all aware, indigenous women in North America are 3.5 times more likely to be murdered or go missing than any other um, race, especially Caucasian women. And yeah. it's far more, it's far less likely that it'll re be reported or get any media coverage. If you want to help create more traction uh, and get these cases reported and seen on social media and even on news channels, you can go to Sovereign Bodies Institute or the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Uh, they have a lot going on. Um, you can sign petitions, you can find forums, you can, you can channel cases through uh, platforms that are already set up for them. No, that sounds amazing, and I want to thank you girls for joining me. Thanks for having thank us. You. This was a, a, a really great talk. We'll see you again soon. And thank you to our viewers for joining us once again. This is Simone Ivani with Ava Blackwell and Julia Cosby. You're watching the International News Channel on TAG TV. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to stay up to date on all our latest videos.